Hi, Jansen. Come on, Jansen. I'm going to We at the current hospital are ready whenever you are. Thank you, the current hospital. Let's confirm with our IT people. Tuka, are we ready? Uh, yes, yes, we are ready. We are ready. Yes. Okay, let's start. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being with us this evening. On behalf of the University of Nairobi community, I sincerely thank everyone of you for taking your time to log on this evening. It is indeed a pressure and we are pre pleased to welcome you. The COVID-19 pandemic has turned most of the sectors upside down and the health sector is no exception. Therefore, we are here today in partnership with the current hospital to bring more attention on non-communicable diseases during this pandemic our webinar this evening will cover two topics, namely the screening of the cancer of the prostate, and two, we'll look at the relationship between diabetes, hypertension, overweight, and the heart diseases. Our key speakers for the two topics, the one of the heart diseases will be done by Dr. Dan Gekonyo, who is a chief cardiologist and director and founder of the current hospital. The second one will be done by Dr. Frederick Kinama, who is our senior medical officer at the University Health Services, and he's also coordinating the HIV and aquine drug program for the university. The other panelists who are going to be managing the QA and they are drawn from the two institutions and we have Dr. Lance Mayabi, who is a general surgeon from the current hospital. Dr. Stephen Omondi, a physician and cardiology fellow, also from the current hospital. From the University of Nairobi side, we have our three physicians, namely Dr. Maureen Muyondi, Dr. Lucy Mbogo, and Dr. Florence Kerry. So without taking much of your time, I want to call upon Dr. Getare, who is going to moderate the session for us so that he can take over and introduce our speakers. Thank you. Dr. Getare? Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much, our CMO, Dr. Lucy Mohair. Uh, I would like to be, to, to, I'm pleased to be your moderator today. And I would like to introduce our speakers today, namely uh, Dr. Kinama, who will be handling uh, prostate cancer. Dr. Kenama, as our CMO has said, is a senior medical officer. Uh, he is also our coordinator at the UHS for drug and uh, alcohol and drug abuse. 
as well as HIV, uh, AIDS prevention uh, programs. Uh, our other presenter will be uh, Dr. Gikonyo, Dr. Dan Gikonyo. Uh, Dr. Gikonyo is well known. He needs no introduction because he is a man of many firsts, first as an alumni of the University of Nairobi. We know what he has done as an, an alumni. Number two, as a medical practitioner. And number three, as an entrepreneur. Dr. Dr. Ekonyo is one of the most coveted cardiologists in Kenya. He's both an interventional and non-invasive adult cardiologist. He has a thriving practice of over 43 years. He has been instrumental in mentoring and training of the majority of adult okay. cardiologists in the country and in the region. With over four decades of experience, Dr. Ekonyo has attended thousands of patients drawn from various parts of the world. He has attended several international conferences and written numerous papers touching on cardiac and other topical health matters. That is Dr. Gikonyo for us. We are very privileged to have Dr. Gikonyo with us today. I think uh, his, his, his insight will be of use to us and to our patients. Uh, to help Dr. Gikonyo from current hospital, will be the chief executive officer of the current hospital, uh, Mrs. Juliet Nyaga. She has over 18 years of professional experience in leadership, research, and care operations and management. She holds a master's of public health degree in epidemiology from the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, uh, a bachelor of science degree in biology and Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, Massachusetts, USA. He is currently the CEO of the Karen Hospital, like I said earlier. Also in the team from Karen Hospital is uh, Dr. Lance Jerry Mayabi. Uh, he is a general surgeon. He has performed over 2,000 operations since he started practicing. practicing he holds a master's of medicine in surgery from the Aga Khan University Hospital. He is a COSECA, College of Surgeons of East, Central, and South Africa program director for Karen Hospital. Also from Karen is Dr. Stephen Omodi, a physician and cardiology fellow. With over 10 years of working experience, he holds a master's of internal medicine from the Aga Khan University, Nairobi and is currently undertaking a master's degree in clinical trial at the University of London. At the current hospital, he has performed over 1,600 procedures. Uh, on our side at the University of, Nairobi Health, University of Nairobi Health Services, we have senior medical officers, uh, Dr. Florence Kelly, uh, Dr. Lucy Bogo, and Dr. Muyodi, who will be the facilitators. They will be taking questions and answering them on the, on the charts, on the side chart. Uh, the, the questions that they will not have handled will be, ha will be handled at the end of our presentations. And at this point, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Dr. F.S. Kinama, to take us through prostate cancer. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Kinama, welcome to the floor. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can. can. Thank you we so much. Hear you, doctor. Good evening to everyone. Our presentation today is going to be based on uh, prostate cancer. This is uh, one of the NCDs that we have affecting mostly males in the population. Actually, it's only a male cancer. So my presentation today is going to be centered at, uh, around prostate cancer. And a brief outline for my presentation, you're going to learn what the prostate is and its functions, some of the risk factors that predispose one to getting prostate cancer, and then how it presents, the early signs and symptoms that one should have to be suspicious of prostate cancer. And we're going to do diagnosis. And lastly, we're going to finish with management that will also be tackled with the surgical team in the, in the lineup today. So I'd like to start with, uh, what is the prostate? prostate? The prostate is a gland that produces some of the fluid that carries sperm during ejaculation. It is a gland that surrounds the urethra. That is the tube through which urine passes out of the male body. And the ball size, it's the size of a chestnut and it weighs around 30 grams. So it's actually quite a small gland in comparison. So in risk factors, Risk factors we have, number one, which is the most common is the older age. The risk for prostate cancer increases as one age, one gains age, and it's most common after the age of 50. No one knows why, how it starts, but studies in autopsy show that one in three men over the age of 50 have some cancer cells in their prostate. This is, some of them could be uh, early on, others could be symptomatic, others were unsymptomatic. So it is found that the older we are, the higher we risk we are. The number two risk factors is race. For reasons, again, not determined, black people have a greater propensity and a risk to develop cancers in comparison to other races. This has been studies that have been done. And in black people, it is found to be more aggressive. Or and sometimes when you have it advanced, it tends to be quite advanced, also sometimes in diagnosis. Another thing you have to note is also family history. If a blood relative, such as a parent, a sibling, or even a child, sometimes tend to get these cancers earlier. That's why you have sometimes the children develop it earlier than the parents with uh, any form of cancer. They are at risk. So they should make sure that they go for early screening whenever possible. And also family history gives us a, a history of genes that increase the risk of other cancers, such as the breast cancer, such as the BRCA1 and BRCA2. So those are the two. Another uh, risk factor is obesity. When one is obese, they say they have a higher risk of prostate cancer compared with people who have a healthy, within normal uh, weight through studies. However, it has shown mixed results. But what has been shown is that obese people tend to have a more aggressive type of development of cancer in initially than the non-obese. Another risk factor that has been found in almost all cancer is smoking. Studies show that prostate cancer may double with heavy smokers, and it is linked to a higher risk of dying from prostate cancer. However, when someone stops within 10 years, the risk is as equal as the person who doesn't smoke. This has also been shown in the packages of our cigarettes that we get. According to the law, they have displayed, and they actually show that smoking increases your risk though they've not drawn a picture of a prostate cancer there, but at least you can be able to have an idea of the many cancers, the lung, which is actually most pro prominent, that actually causes. And however, that causes many cancers, and that is why we cannot miss putting it as one of our risk factors. So now, what are the early signs and uh, symptoms? It's good to know that some of the other signs and symptoms of uh, prostate cancer can also be equal to other symptoms that are presentable. Like for example, we have a burning during, burning pain during urination, difficulty, trouble starting and stopping urination, most frequent urges to urinate at night, loss of bladder control, decreased flow of velocity of urine stream, blood in urine, which is some, which are normally called hematuria. You sometimes get uh, blood in semen and also they get difficulty in, getting an ejection, which is also referred to erectile dysfunction and painful ejaculation. From the signs and symptoms, it is wise to have your clinician to 
have investigation because some of these things also overlie with symptoms such as urinary tract infection, you get a prostatitis and also inflammation that could mask as a prostate cancer. So when you have any or most of these symptoms, it is advisable you go for a thorough checkup and screening so that we can be able to identify the ones that can be treated, can be treated early. And if it is found to have some of these, uh, uh, some it could be cancerous, we have to investigate further, stage it and give treatment as appropriate. You've heard me mention screening. So what does screening mean? Screening means testing for disease, even if no symptoms. They say that uh, at a certain age, like we have seen the risk factors is 50 years and above. So if you know that you're over 50 years, it is good with or without the above symptoms, go for a screening test. These uh, screening tests include a prostatic specific antigen, which you normally call PSA, which is a blood test, and also have a digital rectal examination. The two are used to screen for prostate cancer and are used to detect cancer quite early. However, some of these tests are not perfect and you can also get abnormal results either way. You can either get a positive due to benign prostatic enlargement or an infection that would lead to an increase in your PSA or also cancer that could also lead an increase in PSA. So however, the tests with a clinical examination do go hand in hand to make sure that one is able to be evaluated and be screened and treated. Need to further elaborate uh, on the screening of the digital rectal examination, most commonly referred as a DRE, is whereby your doctor inserts a gloved, lubricated finger into the rectum to examine your prostate, which is adjacent to the rectum. If your doctor finds an anomaly in the texture, the shape, and the size of gland, it may necessitate further tests. Some of the texture, it's supposed to be a smooth, pure gland, and it's supposed to be small. So when you find it in the size, it's an increase, one is supposed to be suspicious. Also the shape, if you find it having lumps, one is supposed to get suspicious and further tests are needed. Another test that can also be done during screening is the PSA, whereby as blood is drawn from a vein and analyzed for PSA. This is known, uh, PSA is a substance that is naturally produced by a prostate gland. It's normal in small amounts to be in your bloodstream. However, in, in a higher level, generally may indicate either prostate infection, inflammation, enlargement or cancer. That is why we say when it's PSA is enlarged, we need to do other tests. Other tests include uh, not the definitive tests where you take a biopsy of the tissue, whereby the tissue is removed and examined for the presence of uh, cancerous cells. Uh, biopsy usually is done uh, through the ultrasound. You can have ultrasound guided whereby you put a probe and you take some snips that are taken and examine, examined. You can also do imaging tests for diagnosis, whereby we can do an ultrasound scan, we do an MRI, a CT scan, and also a PET scan can be used to determine size and also the staging, because in advanced staging, you find that it spreads. So we scans like the PET scan can tell you how far and the method of management and intervention will be guided us from there. Most common spread is usually on the bones, so you tend to have weak bones, so in the imaging scans, you can be able to find this usually most commonly in the CT scan. And also CT, the PET scan will show you the most, the foci as it spreads. Another form of diagnosis, you can use uh, advanced genomic testing, whereby it looks at the anomalies of, of the cancer so that it determines the best chemotherapy combination that you can use to be able to help the patient overcome it. Um, management is dependent on the stage and the diagnosis of cancer. Most commonly when it is found early and it is local, surgery has been found to be effective. Uh, sometimes you can find it, it has maybe passed at a certain stage, the capsular stage, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, both hand in hand, so that we can be able to control the cancer cells. Common therapy has also been used to make sure that it does not, uh, to be able to control it. And also immunotherapy has also been used in some of the cases that we have found. And um, at this stage, I'd like to maybe welcome the sergeant to maybe talk more on the management so that we can also be at breast on the management of breast cancer. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Kinama. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I would like to invite Dr. Lance Jerry Mayabi, who is a surgeon, to cap it all in terms of uh, in, on, in terms of management of uh, prostate cancer. Dr. Mayabi, please. Dr. Mayabi. And please, participants, you can uh, type all your questions, any queries, any questions, clarifications on the chat box, and uh, you will be answered or you will be addressed. Is Dr. Mayabi in? I can't see her. OK, then. Uh, if Dr. Mayabi is not in, uh, we shall go to our next presenter. And we are really privileged to have Dr. Dan Gikonyo. Uh, like I said, he's a man of many firsts. He doesn't actually need any introduction uh, in many of his areas or in, in areas of his exploit. Uh, I would like to, to, to invite uh, Dr. Dan Gikonyo. Dr. Gikonyo, we are very privileged to have you here with us. We don't take it for granted. Please welcome Dr. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kinama. It's a great privilege for me to be requested to be a participant in this uh, session. And I must apologize for Dr. Mayabi because I didn't inform him that he was going to be part of this session. It's all my fault, except my apologies. Uh, mine will be more a look at uh, the current crisis of COVID and uh, non-communicable diseases. I was introduced as an alumni of the University of Nairobi, which I am privileged to be, but my greatest association, uh, Dr. Kenama, Professor Atemo, Lucy Mohia, is my greatest association with university is the 27th, 29th of June, 1974. As you can see that young man there who got married to a beautiful girl called Dr. Betty Gikonyo on the 29th of June, 1974. That's a close up, but I'll show you the bigger photograph. There it is. That is the Cactus Garden at the University of Nairobi across from the Great Court next to the Science Building. That is where we had our reception on the 29th of June, 1974. Therefore, I can claim uh, Professor Atemo to be an associate of the university in more than one way, because apart from getting a medical degree, I ended up getting a better degree outside the Great Court in June, 1974. Let me point out to you, little young man sitting in front here, who is Dr. Eric Kahogo, the famous maxillofacial surgeon at the Nairobi Hospital, and the late Dr. Wallace Kahogo, that's just to lay claim to the University of Nairobi that I'm truly an alumni in more than one way. We are talking from the current hospital, which was opened in 2006 by none other than the third president of the Republic of Kenya, uh, Honorable Moai Kebake, now retired in uh, 2006. Current hospital is not just a hospital. We do have our various programs associated with the hospital. We do have a nursing school, the training school, that both trains nurses and uh, cardiac clinic officers. So we are a training institution. We get, we certify uh, medical doctors for internship. We have an internship program. We are in the COSEXA a program where we going to train, cardiac, uh, to train general surgeons as from next year. We are a center for certification of physicians. One is the University of Nairobi, other universities before they are registered as physicians. We also have our, uh, our CSI arm where we do corporate responsibility through the Heart to Heart Foundation, where we assist children born with their heart problems or who have acquired heart problems. Uh, to acquire surgery at costs that they cannot afford on their own. 
The University of Nairobi has been our great partner in this Heart to Heart Foundation. The hospital itself has various other branches all over the country. We have outpatient services in Nakuru, in Naivasha, uh, in uh, the Central Business District in Nairobi. We are also in Nyeri and in Karatina. Uh, we have a center in Meru, in Thika, and also in Rogai. These are facilities where we take services to the people, mainly cardiac services, but also general medical services to the people in those centers. And hopefully in the next three, four, five years, we intend to be in every county of this country if our plans do go well. Today we will discuss about communicable diseases, but also in the current crisis of COVID. Because for a long time, we have been fighting communicable diseases, HIV, TB, and mal malaria. And we almost succeeded in uh, handling this completely. Then something else happened. COVID came to make it worse. And we also have an epidemic that has now become even worse than COVID, the epidemic of non-communicable diseases that have made our health systems more difficult to manage. I will not go, I will not go much into COVID because we, by now all of us know about the coronavirus disease, how it is started in China, how it is spread to the rest of the world, how it has become a major pandemic all over the world since a year ago, December 2019. As of today, the worrisome statistics is that in Kenya, we already have had 83,316 cases, and you can add 701 that have been added today. Of these, 54,000 have recovered. And my slide has hidden the number that died. I must see how I can remove here so you can both see the number are ah, beautiful. That's good. Uh, out of the 54, 83,000 cases, you can see, we have had now over 1,452 deaths. And today alone, the last 24 hours, we have lost seven. These are worrying statistics. But let me tell you, the good Lord has been kind to us because if you compare to the countries like the US, India, Brazil, Russia, and other countries, they have fared much worse than us. Uh, and we do hope that this low incidence in our country will continue and we shall be saved from worse pandemics. But that, when you are at it, let me just mention to the viewers because we are all not medical. Whereas this disease started in March, April this year, the initial cases that we saw in March, April, May, June, July, August were very mild. The mortality rate was low, but in the last three, four weeks, the mortality of this disease has been of concern and worrying. We have had much more severe disease, much more mortalities, and more, much more requirement of intensive care. But we do hope that this slight wave will also pass and uh, hope that we shall be saved from bigger problems. The symptoms of COVID are well known, the fever, the cough, the breathlessness, the fatigue, the muscle aches, the congestion and running nose, the headaches, sore throats, loss of taste and smell, nausea and vomiting, those are now all well known to all of us because they're in the media every day. What we don't know much about, and I'd like to mention, is that although we think COVID is just a viral infection of the lungs, the major problem that causes mortality uh, and much severe morbidity is because of a role the virus plays in inflammation in the body. The virus enters the body by attaching itself to a receptor called the angiotensin converting enzyme in, in uh, enzyme uh, receptor through which the virus enters the body or the cells. Say, for example, after it held it, it goes through the lungs and attaches itself through the receptor, enters the cells, and then the real problem begins. 
because once it enters these cells, it sets up a very severe inflammatory response called the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. This actually is what is causing deaths in patients, not just the lungs themselves, but the inflammatory response that occurs in the other organs, the kidneys, the heart, the brain, the blood vessels. It becomes a major inflammatory response all over the body. I would give an example of a matchstick. The virus is just like a matchstick that you light out there in the jungle, in the wilderness. And after a little while, that matchstick causes a huge fire that now burns the whole forest. So the virus is just a small component of the initial response that triggers much worse response. Once in the body, the virus triggers a major inflammatory response that causes damage to the blood vessels all over the body, causing kidney failure, heart failure, um, heart attacks, brain damage, lung damage, liver damage, and that is why people are dying from this illness. And that's why you find that medicines that control inflammation like steroids are being useful, have been found to be useful in controlling the outcome of this disease. Now, just for general public information for those of us who are in this session, what do you do if you are diagnosed with COVID-19 or if you have symptoms of COVID and you have not been tested, what should you do? If you have been tested positive, please stay home, stay calm, uh, keep away from family members, don't go to work if you can, stay out of public transport, don't go to public places, don't go shopping, stay home, don't go to church, don't have visitors, don't leave home if you have been tested positive, at least for 14 days. That way you protect other people from getting the virus. So if you have COVID-19, please isolate yourself. Stay from other people. Even in your house, if you're a family member, take a special bedroom with your own bathroom. Don't share with the rest of the family. Wear the mask all the time. Avoid coughing and sneezing into the open air and keep yourself isolated, watching your heart and keeping sure, making sure you don't spread it to the rest of the family. There are two terminologies here, Prof. One is quarantine and the other is isolation that we need to understand. Quarantine is when you have been in contact with somebody who has symptoms of COVID, but yourself, you have not, you have not developed COVID. You should quarantine yourself. Isolation is when you have tested positive for the virus and, or you have symptoms that are consistent with the virus. In that case, you need to avoid contact with other people and isolate yourself for 14 days minimum. You may need retesting, but even if you don't, re, re, don't retest yourself, it, the studies have shown that after 14 days or so, you are safe to come out in the community. But quarantine is when you have been just exposed but not sick. And the exposure, we say, is when you have been in contact with somebody who has been now confirmed to have COVID, be close to one another for less than, in a distance of less than one meter. You've been together more, for more than 15 minutes. None of you is wearing masks. If somebody you have been close like that tests positive, which might include your wife or your husband, then you are close contact and you must therefore isolate yourself uh, from uh, the community. The reason you're having this session today is to see where does communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular non-communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases, where do they come in in this fight or in this disease pandemic of COVID? Because these non-communicable diseases are the ones that are putting us in higher risk of either getting infected or getting severe illness and much worse of dying from COVID. Who is at great risk of having severe disease or dying from COVID? It is those of us, unfortunately like me, who are over the age of 60, those of us who are overweight. Weight is a major risk factor for COVID. And that's why we are talking about these non-communicable diseases because 
they make the outcome of COVID worse. High blood pressure, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, heart disease and lung disease, cancer, HIV, TB, asthma, uh, uh, all those diseases make the risk of dying from COVID real. It is now known that if you look at the mortality of dying from COVID, the highest uh, risk of dying is in those people with cardiovascular disease. 10% of people who get COVID, people of, sorry, people of cardiovascular disease have a 10% chance higher than the average person of dying from COVID. If you have cardiovascular disease, your risk of dying of COVID, COVID is 10.5%. If you don't have any coexisting factors, your risk is less than one. That means if you don't have any of these other diseases and you get COVID and you're not overweight, you don't have cancer, you don't have hypertension, you, have not, you don't have chronic airway disease, no diabetes, and no cardiovascular disease, the chance of dying from COVID is low. It's less than 1%. It's not zero, but it's much lower. It rises if you have these other comorbidities of cancer, high blood pressure, lung disease, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, of course, I'd put them in there, things like HIV and asthma and cigarette abuse. Therefore, if you're at high risk, you're over 60, you're overweight, you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure, please keep yourself safe. High blood pressure and diabetes as risk factors in COVID are there if those two, these two conditions are not controlled. That means the risk of dying from COVID is higher, not just if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, it is if you have diabetes or high blood pressure that is not well controlled. So if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, if you have them controlled very well, your risk of dying from COVID becomes less. There's another small gadget we call oximeter. This is a small gadget that measures oxygen levels in the blood. And this is something I think if you have a relative or you have COVID yourself, you must keep in the house because it measures the amount of oxygen that gets into the lungs. And once it drops below 92%, it should then seek medical help in a hospital. But there are things you can do as you isolate yourself at home even if you have COVID. These are known facts and they're known, they are not be useful. Eat healthy, no smoking. We know that some levels of vitamin D are useful. Other supplements like zinc and vitamin C are also useful. And when I say vitamin D, you can get quite about a, a dose of it from just exposing yourself to good sunlight that is easily available. When should you worry if you have COVID? If you test positive, and then you find that your symptoms are worsening or they have not improved after seven days, please, seek medical advice. It can get worse and it's get, it gets worse by day 10, day 11, day 12. If you have COVID tested positive and you find that you have problems of concentrating, you're getting confused, it's a sign that your oxygen levels are low. And therefore, please seek medical advice. If you have a fever that's not going away, you have chest pain and you're coughing a lot, please seek medical advice. If you have diabetes and your sugars are not well controlled, seek medical advice. If your breathing becomes difficult and you're taking more than 25 breaths in a minute, or if you have a, that small gadget we call an oximeter and your oxygen levels are dropping below 92%, please go and seek medical advice. Go to hospital. You are the type of person who needs to be hospitalized. But all in all, please wear a mask both to protect yourself from infection and protect other people from catching your infection if you have it. But I want to reassure you about this COVID because it's not going to finish humanity. If you read Genesis chapter one, verse 26, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our own likeness and let them, the men, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fall of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing 
that creepeth upon the earth. That is, the good Lord gave us dominion over all these other organisms, including the one that creepeth upon the earth, include the viruses. So which are overcome, we have been given dominion over all these, don't worry, we shall not get finished by this virus. How do I know that? Remember the Spanish flu in 1918? The Spanish flu in 1918 killed more than 50 million people in the world. That is like the whole population of this country. And you know those days in 1918, the world population was not very large. So 50 million out of the world population that those days was a lot of people. So many people died, but we are still here. The Asian flu came, the Hong Kong flu came, the Russian flu came, the swine flu came, and we are still here. So don't panic. We shall not get annihilated. Look at smallpox. It was there in the 1920s in Africa, very high levels. But over time, it went down and down and down. And by last century, smallpox was exterminated from the world. It did not annihilate human beings. Look at HIV. In the 90s, the increase was very rapid. But over time, through both human intervention and alteration of human behavior, the prevalence of HIV is slowly coming down. So we shall survive the pandemic of COVID. But to make sure that you and I survive, please let us take care of our lifestyle diseases. These lifestyle diseases, I call them lifestyle because they are manageable to a large extent by lifestyle modification. These lifestyle diseases are diseases of the heart causing heart attacks. There are some types of cancers diabetes, stroke, HIV and AIDS, accidents, and chronic respiratory conditions. These are lifestyle. Cancer, we can debate about lifestyle, but some of them are related to lifestyle because cancer of the lung is related to lifestyle of smoking cigarette. Cancer of the cervix, to a certain extent, is sometimes related to sexual behavior. So these conditions are modifiable if we take our lives much more seriously. Let's talk about coronary artery disease. This is a disease that uh, is new in this part of the world. When I say new is because we have seen it come into this country from outside. When you were in medical school in the 70s, coronary artery disease that causes heart attacks was extremely rare. And if you had one case, you called the whole medical school come and discuss it. Whereas we had maybe one or two cases being seen at Kenyatta National Hospital, maybe per year or five years, now coronary artery disease and heart attacks in the African are occurring on a daily basis. And this most likely is because of lifestyle changes, because the genetics of our people have not changed. And most likely then the, cul the culprit uh, is lifestyle. Just to give a diagrammatic appearance here, coronary artery disease is due to deposition of plaques on the inside of the vessels. And these plaques are made of, are made of uh, cholesterol and other types of debris, including little blood clots. And they gradually increase over time. That means as we are born, as we, as we, as we age, these plaques form on the this let's see one. these plaques form as we get older. And as you get older, just move down. Just allow us to adjust our slides if you can still hear us. Thank you. As we get older, sorry about that. You can see this cross-section of picture of the blood vessels. When you're in your 20s, the blood vessel is neat and clean on the inside. And as grow older, these little plaques of cholesterol keep on forming on the inside of the vessels. And when you are at our age, me and Professor Temo, maybe at this level here, where we are clogging our vessels, 
with our age, irrespective of what we do. This is an aging process. But this process can be quickened by living the, the bad lifestyle. You can quicken the blockage of vessels by not taking care of those conditions that increase the risk of the heart attacks. Heart attacks have become very common, and it's good that we know how they present so that you know what to do when they occur. And heart attacks come mainly by causing chest pain. And the pain is central, it's crushing, makes you sweat, becomes short of breath. If you get that type of pain and you are of the age of 45, please know that it's a possible heart attack, possible chest pain, that is behind the sternum with shortness of breath and difficult in breathing. Make your way to the hospital. Don't wait at home to see what happens. Even if you are not sure, be sure when you get to hospital. And if you have a chance, if you get that type of chest pain, you are of the age of 45, please take an aspirin and go to a medical facility. It's better to be told it is not than to wait at home because heart attacks, the first hour, is very precious. It can be aborted if you get home. If you get to hospital early, a heart attack can be aborted. Who gets heart attacks? Well, people with these risk factors. Some of them we call modifiable because you can modify them. Others are not modifiable because they are shauriya mungu. For example, if you have family history of the disease, as you age, if you are male, not female, these risk factors you can do nothing about. But these others, that's why we're having this topic for today. These are things we can do about to protect ourselves from getting heart attacks and uh, strokes and cardiovascular diseases. Smoking, that's one thing that you absolutely not do. Take care of your cholesterol by what you eat. Measure your blood pressure every uh, now and again and make sure it's normal. If it's not normal, please take your pill for blood pressure permanently. Have your blood sugar checked at least once a year, if not more frequently, if you're over the age of 40. And if the diabetes uh, is confirmed, take your medications regularly, reduce your weight, eat healthy, and exercise a lot. Avoid taking excess alcohol. Take care of your weight. And how do you know if you have the right weight? Just measure, take a tape measure and measure your waist circumference. For men, if your circumference around the oblicus is more than 40 inches, you are overweight. Around the oblica, not at the waist, at, at, the, at the umbilical level. If you are more than 102 and you are a man, please reduce your weight. If you are more than 88, which is 35 inches, at the navel area, and you are female, you are overweight. But for me as a doctor, I find it very easy to tell somebody who is overweight because I just watch them as they come through the door to the clinic. And I look at which part of the body comes in first. If the tummy comes in first, you're overweight because it's your feet and your nose that can come in first. But if I see your tummy first, then I know there's a problem. Take care of your cholesterol, it can be measured. And this can be measured even at the most low medical facilities in the countryside including the blood sugar, to know whether one has diabetes. Because cardiovascular disease has now become the leading cause of death in the world. We are talking about COVID. COVID is causing death, but not anything compared to what we are seeing from cardiovascular disease. Blood vessel disease that are clogged by cholesterol are causing a huge global burden of disease in the world. And this is worse because now it's coming to countries that we call developing or third world, where managing these conditions become very, very difficult. And therefore, that's why lifestyle becomes very, very important. We must control our blood pressure and our blood sugar. But see what's happened with the blood pressure. This is a Kenya data from 1980. You look at the blood pressure in the general public, there's a gradual increase from 1980 onwards in the mean systolic blood pressure. That means all of us are getting higher blood pressure more than we had before, mainly from lifestyle. The same thing with diabetes. Diabetes is to a large extent a lifestyle disease. 
It's what you eat. It's how much weight you have. It's how much physical exercise you do. Much worse if you combine it with bad habits like cigarette smoking. Most of the kidney units where we are doing dialysis in this country are the kidney disease, kidney failure is being caused by diabetes. Most of the limb loss, amputations, blindness, heart attacks and strokes are being caused by diabetes. Diabetes is a, to a large extent lifestyle and it can be controlled by eating right, exercising and keeping our weight down. Look at the rise in mean blood sugar from 1980, both men and women, the society, the population in this country is increasing the basic blood glucose. And that is understandable because as you know, we have stopped walking, which we used to do a long time ago. We are more sedentary, we sit in offices, we eat the wrong type of stuff and we gain weight and become diabetic. And the projections by the year 2030, 2025 is even worse. We are going to have an increase of 80% of diabetes in Africa by the year 2025. This is worrying, but this we can control. COVID, we have also said, is becoming more severe and causing mortality in the people with respiratory disease. Respiratory disease, to large extent, some cannot be blamed on anybody because asthma runs in families. It's an allergic process that you have no control. But there are other things that you can control that cause chronic airway disease. Air pollution, smoke from our cars, from our factories, but much worse, smoke that we generate ourselves in our little, uh, not very intelligent ways, cigarette smoking. This is something that actually should be criminalized completely because it is a risk not to yourself, but society. Because if you look at all the chemicals that are found in cigarette smoke, including formaldehyde, the one we use in mortuaries, all these things are in the cigarette. And when you smoke, you are a danger to yourself and also a danger to people around you. Because cigarette smoking increases coronary artery disease, it causes lung cancer and other lung diseases, and therefore this increases the risk of dying from COVID. It causes early death by causing cardiovascular disease and strokes. It increases the risk of hypertension. It causes peripheral vascular disease, causing uh, limb loss. But much worse for the men listening to this, cigarette smoking is one major cause of impotence and imp impaired fatality. So if you have no other reason maybe to stop smoking and you're a man, just know that it will affect your, your fertility, you are become impotent, and maybe knowing that and looking at that picture, you might then stop smoking, I hope. Weight loss is something we must talk about because as we do less exercise and we eat more uh, carbohydrate, starch and sugars, we become obese. And we say you are obese, when you have more than 20% of weight above the normal weight. We all know about the body mass index, which is a calculation we do by taking our weight in kilograms and dividing it by our height in meters squared. And the normal BMI is between 18 and 24. Anybody whose BMI is going to 35 and 40, we are in a lot of problems, and this is areas that we can control. It is true that uh, weight to a large extent is genetic, but even genetic weight can be controlled. And the body mass index in our population continues to rise as the years come by, and it's all lifestyle. Lifestyle because it's the type of thing that we are feeding our children with, and they seem to like it, and it's sweet and nice, but most of the sweet things are not healthy, unfortunately. So we at the current hospital, apart from talking about these diseases, we do have a wellness and preventive medicine program where you can walk in and we can advise you about your wellness and how you can prevent yourself from getting these 
cardiovascular diseases. We can offer risk assessment based on the history and physical examination that we do. We can advise you on nutritional assessment and recommendation. We can give you screening for some illnesses, including diabetes, high blood pressure. We do offer dental screening and we do offer eye checkup. And we check your cholesterol and advise you what level you are at and what you can do to reduce your blood cholesterol. We advise on weight and how to reduce weight. And there are many ways now of re reducing weight apart from just diet and exercise. There are operations that we do that reduce the size of the stomach and therefore make it difficult for you to retain more food. At our wellness program, we advise on physical exercise. And as you come to current hospital one day, you'll notice that at the entrance there, there's a notice saying, please do not use the elevator, walk up the stairs. And I promise you, you will never catch me in any of the hospital, hospital lifts. And the staff here know that if you catch them, they walk down and walk up again. We do screening for breast cancer. We do screening for cervical cancer. We do screening for ovarian cancer. We do screening for gastric and colorectal cancer. We do screening for lung cancer and prostate cancer has been discussed and I will not say much more about it. We advise on immunizations because as we get older, like children, we require vaccinations. Flu vaccinations is useful for people who have chronic airway disease or chronic heart disease or other chronic illnesses. Human papilloma virus vaccination is useful for teenagers. Pneumococcal vaccine is useful for people with chronic airway disease. We do have various packages for wellness and you can come and check in and we can, we can discuss more about how we can make you healthy. But don't panic about the COVID virus because we have been made in the image of God and we have been given dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fall of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping creature that creepeth upon the earth which includes the virus. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Over to you, Keman. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gikonyo. Uh, you are for the very nice presentation. You have talked to us about science, scripture, and history. And uh, your talk gives us a warning about uh, our health in relation to COVID-19 and non-communicable diseases. And it also gives us hope that we shall not perish despite the, 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 the devastation that COVID-19 threatens to cause us. Uh, I would like to us to go to the question and answer session straight away because we have a resource in this team. These moderators and the presenter, presenters are a resource. So uh, members and participants, if you have any questions, please uh, type it in the in the chat in the chat box and it will be replied to however uh, i have a few items question items one uh, by ibrahim uh, mauti uh, and he's asking about insight into how one can benefit from uhc so i would like any of the panelists who is conversant with UH, uhc Universal Healthcare to give us insight, please. Professor, I mean, Dr. Gikonyo, are you able? Now the Universal Healthcare is, as you know, is being rolled out by the Minister of Health in different segments. And uh, it, the target is mainly for the uh, average uh, Kenyan to be able to access healthcare at affordable costs. Uh, there have been trials running in some uh, counties 
uh, of which our, my country, Nyeri, was one of them. And it is still in the process of being uh, rolled out. Uh, I would need to be corrected. Uh, it's not yet uh, targeting all the population for which it is meant to target. But that is the, the, the dream of the, of the government that um, we should be able to give universal health care to uh, all our deserving populations. But that target has not been achieved yet. Thank you very much, Dr. Gikonyo. Uh, I hope uh, Ma Mauti and uh, others uh, are able to benefit from your answer. The second uh, question was from Eric Gumbi. Eric Gumbi wanted to know what happens to the COVID-19 virus after 14 days once you have tested positive. The, the uh, COVID-19 virus, like any other organism that has, attacks the body, sets up a fight between itself and the body. And what happens, either the body is overcome and there's a mortality or fatality, or the virus is overcome by the body. The experience we have so far is that the cycle of the body fighting the virus is about 10 to 14 days. Just like you know, for example, if you get a common cold, there's a cycle of about seven days where you get symptoms, you get very sick, then you recover. Even without a type of therapy, the body immune system has a way of uh, overcoming the virus within a given time. The same with the COVID virus, that within two weeks of symptoms, unless you are going to succumb to it, you do recover from the, the virus, purely from the immune system that the body mounts against the virus. Yes, about, about 14 days or so, most people have recovered and they're not infected. That's a normal cycle of the virus. It is true that some people continue to, gen to give the virus a little longer. They give, they're able to have the virus a little, but in the majority of people, within 14 days, the body overcomes the virus and you are no longer infected. Thank you very much, Dr. Gekonyo, for, your, for the clear explanation. Uh, I am sure Eric Gumbi has understood. The other questions are in relation to our first presenter, Dr. Kinama, and I'll ask any of the panelists who feel uh, adequately prepared to respond. And the first question is one, can can a person get completely healed from cancer of the prostate? The other one is, can a child of 10 to 14 years get cancer of the prostate? Any of, of the participants? Please un unmute panelists and uh, address those two questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gitari, for the question. One, can one get completely healed from uh, prostate uh, cancer? Is in the channel chat there are those uh, modes of uh, management you can have surgery. So if one had a cancer lesion that was detected early and then surgery is performed and the gland is removed, we have no source for the primary, so one can be said to be completely healed from that. However, depending on the stage and the time of diagnosis, you can have sometimes people are discovered late when it has already moved out of uh, the prostate gland, now it has metastasized. So there, you can only see it. Some of these effects, like I said, affects most commonly bones. So they tend to be brittle. It goes to the lungs. So there, it is difficult for you to say you are completely healed. Surgery will be of no benefit. So what will be of benefit will be chemotherapy to go systematically. And the next question is a 13 year old to get prostate cancer. I have not read that somewhere and I've not seen it. I don't think it's possible because again, it is overused. So I can say I've not heard and I've not read anywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kinama. Uh, another question for Dr. Gikonyo. 
Uh, please, Dr. Ikonyo, comment on uh, red wine in relation to cardiovascular diseases. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. The, the, there has been a lot of talk about red wine uh, being uh, protective against cardiovascular disease. Uh, let me say that the data is not fully convincing. Although there has been association of less cardiovascular disease in areas where people consume red wine. This theory came from the low levels of cardiovascular disease, specifically heart attacks in the populations in the Mediterranean region, uh, Italy, Spain, people who consume higher levels of red wine having less uh, cardiovascular disease than their counterparts who drink less were in the Scandinavian countries, Northern Europe and such. But there's not a definite scientific data. The way to protect ourselves from getting cardiovascular disease is the one that we know to be 100% well-documented, control blood sugar, control blood pressure, control cholesterol, do not smoke, have regular exercise, and uh, take medications as advised. Those are more important than any other type of thing we hear about protecting ourselves from cardiovascular disease. I mention again cigarette smoking because in this day and age with available data, you have to be extremely uh, not very wise to keep on smoking. Thank you very much, Dr. Gikonyo. Another person, uh, Mr. Yusuf, wants to know whether CAT has any association with cardiovascular disease, CAT, Mira. Again, a lot of debate whether Mira is a drug, which I think it is. Uh, it is a pseudo ephedrine type of medication that increases your adrenergic drive. Adrenergic is the same thing as what you produce from with adrenaline in your body. And we know that adrenergic things uh, or drives do cause many things. They increase the heart rate, they increase blood pressure. And therefore, in theory, knowing that blood pressure and high heart rate are associated with heart disease, consumption of cat or mira could increase the risk of heart disease. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Uh, Yusuf, the same D. Yusuf, uh, wants to know whether cat can regulate sugar levels. Uh, again, going by what we call today evidence-based medicine, we do not have it, any evidence to that effect. So Yusuf, you have been answered point on. Uh, is there any other question? Any, anyone can type? Uh, he, he, uh, he, he, and, uh, there is a Jane. He wants you to comment on long-term effects of COVID-19 infection. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, moderator, that question. Especially in relation to anxiety. Yeah, Anton, there, there, there is, there is uh, data uh, of what is called the psychological effects, the neurological effects of the post-COVID infection. But remember, we are talking about a disease that we have only known for less than one year. So even all the data that we have of the long-term effect, we can only see long-term effect up to 10, 11 months so far. We have not seen this disease third, fourth, fifth year to know what happens after that. But from the available data, yes, there is a 
post-COVID chronic fatigue syndrome, as post-COVID neurological symptoms, impaired memory, all those things. But the time has been so short that surely we cannot say we have enough data proven by time at the chronic long-term effect of a disease that we have not known for longer than one year. Uh, please bear with us. Uh, there is a person that wants to know the relationship. In your graph, you didn't include HIV in relation to, to COVID-19. What is the risk? Uh, the risk of having HIV and COVID in theory is cumulative. The reason that we are getting a lot of complications from COVID, if you remember a slide of the uh, inflammatory response syndrome, in the conditions that increase the inflammatory response in the body, you increase the complications of COVID. And maybe this why condition like high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, all those diseases that increase the inflammatory response in the body, which we measure by measuring a protein called the C-reactive protein, CRP. Any condition that increases inflammation in the body will complicate the complications of COVID. And in theory, therefore, having HIV and COVID complicates is additive in the risk factors, just like any other inflammatory condition in the body is complicating the complications of COVID. So yes, if you have HIV, but remember, when you talk about HIV or diabetes or high blood pressure, complicating COVID, we are talking about untreated, uncontrolled HIV, high blood pressure, diabetes. If they are controlled, the risk is much less. And controlled, yes, then the risk is much higher. Thank you, Dr. Igoye, for that very straightforward answer. Uh, uh, for the benefit of time, I would like to, to, to stop this session of question and answer uh, if you, are, you still feel that you have uh, some questions that are not addressed, the team from UHS is available. The team from uh, uh, Karen Hospital is also available post this presentation. And uh, so that we may not take too much of your time, I would like uh, to invite Mrs. Juliet Nyaga uh, the CEO of uh, Karen Hospital to say something. Please, Mrs. Juliet Nyaga. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to say something. Uh, my name is Juliet Nyaga. I am the CEO of the Karen Hospital. Um, and before I go further, I would like to also um, say that our chairman, Dr. Betty Gikonyo is also with us on the call. And I would ask her before I continue to say um, something small to the to, to the participants on the on this webinar. Dr. Betty Kikonyo, are you with us? Yes, yes, I am. Karibu. Asante. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is a great opportunity for the current hospital and the, our University of Nairobi, you know, to uh, have a, a webinar and, and, and this uh, collaboration and partnership is very welcome between uh, academic institutions as well and, and, the, and medical institutions. I, I am alumni of the University of Nairobi, long serving member of council of the University of Nairobi and uh, we are very much connected with the University of Nairobi. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to partner in this uh, education program that has reached a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, we appreciate uh, you being with us during this webinar. 
Um, we'd like to say a very big thank you to the University of Nairobi um, uh, team. Uh, uh, we had uh, Professor Ratemo, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Frederick Kinama, we had uh, Dr. Lucy Bogo, we had Dr. Anthony Gitari, Dr. Lucy Muhia, and uh, Maureen Moyodi with us, Dr. Maureen Moyodi. We'd like to say thank you very much on, our, on behalf of the Karen Hospital for taking the time to be part of this webinar. Uh, Professor Ratemo, thank you very much for the um, insightful presentation on prostate cancer. We'd like to encourage everybody to uh, go ahead, um, especially men above the age of uh, 50, uh, to get their PSA uh, test done every year and also to come in for a screening. We do that at the Karen Hospital. Um, in regards to Dr. Uh, the presentation by Dr. Dan Gekonyo on cardiovascular disease and COVID, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Tari, for taking the time uh, this evening to answer a lot of questions and give us quite a bit of information. Um, we at the hospital also are carrying out uh, COVID-19 uh, tests. And um, just to let you know that many of us, private hospitals, at least half of our patients at the moment, um, uh, happen to be um, unfortunately uh, COVID positive and is symptomatic, but at least we are happy that uh, many of them are walking out um, the same way they came, better than the way they came in. So there is hope at the end of the tunnel, as Dr. Gikonyo said. When it comes to wellness, um, we at the hospital do a wellness on wheels program and we'd be more than happy to come to the University of Nairobi to uh, carry out wellness packages, both for the students and also for the, the staff, uh, because we believe that prevention is better than cure and we'd be happy to carry out some tests that we can carry out on site uh, for um, uh, the, 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 the com community at the University of Nairobi. So we look forward to a great partnership and uh, more uh, webinars and uh, screenings uh, done in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, CEO. Uh, uh, at this point in time, I would like to invite our very own Dr. Muyodi uh, to say a few remarks. Dr. Muyodi. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Gitari. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Dr. Maureen Muyodi. I'm a physician at the University of Nairobi Health Services. And it's my privilege tonight to give the vote of thanks. Uh, first and foremost, I give thanks to God for making today's session a resounding success. I'd also like to thank uh, and appreciate all of you uh, who joined us for this webinar. Without you, of course, none of this would have been possible. I have to recognize the two institutions who came together to bring us this webinar. That is the University of Nairobi and the Karen Hospital. We are grateful to the leadership and management of these two institutions through our vice chancellor, Professor Kiyama, and uh, the CEO, Karen Hospital, Mrs. Nyaga. Thank you very much for all the support they gave in making this webinar a success. A uh, special mention to the organizing committee led by our chief medical officer, Dr. Lucy Muhia, who put everything together, ensuring a smooth running with, I would say, minimal, if any, hitches. My heartfelt thanks to our speakers tonight, Dr. Kinama, for a very clear and concise presentation, and especially Dr. Gikonyo for taking time out of his busy schedule to join us this evening and for your very insightful presentation and scintillating discussion during the Q&A session. Um, last but not least, I'd like to thank our moderator, Dr. Gitari. Dr. Gitari is a senior medical officer at our university clinic and is also a psychiatrist. And he has ensured there's been a seamless transition between the speakers. So thank you very much, Dr. Gitari. Uh, finally, I think I'll leave you with an inspiring quote by Martin Luther King, which says, an individual has not started living until he rises above the confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. Thank you all for your attention. And I think this has been a very enjoyable session. And from me, I'd like to say good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Muyodi. Uh, from uh, our panelists, Dr. Florence Kelly, please close for us with a prayer. Dr. Kinama. Oh, Dr. Gitari, Professor Ratemo has something. He had put his hand up. Can I just, I just want to say something very small, really, very yes, small. Thank you, Prof. 
<laughs> but, but you know, we, Dr. thank you very much, both of you, for really very insightful and excellent presentation, extremely easy to follow, which can be put anywhere. My concern is on uh, the very many French fries being cooked along the roadsides all over the country. And now kids and old people can eat French fries anywhere, any place in the most remote rural areas of this country. Shall we have some way, somehow, an, an education that can tell those people that they are actually increasing diabetes and the problems of sugar? I have really seen and appreciated the campuses and the other hostels you have outreach. Could you get to as far as Kehanja or as far as Rabai and promote, reduce the amount of chips being eaten along the road, small streets, using extremely dirty oil? Thank you very much for this opportunity to mention this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Micheka, for that observation. Uh, I'm sure it is food for thought for all of us. Um, I, I, I'd want to, to, to now close the session and I'm requesting a volunteer to say a prayer. Florence, are you there? Dr. Florence Kerry. If Kelly is not there, Muyodi. Dr. Muyodi, say a closing prayer for us, please. Okay. Uh, let us pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, good health. Thank you for allowing us to have this webinar this evening. I want to Pray for all our attendees that you may bless them and keep them in good health, especially during this tough COVID-19 period. Um, we pray, dear Lord, that even as we start our new month, which would be the first final month of the year 2020, which has been a very difficult year, you may see us through and you may reduce and possibly remove the burden of COVID-19 that we are currently grappling with. Um, I'd like to pray, dear Lord, for both these institutions. May we continue working together and uh, may we continue having a good relationship that would lead to even greater health and well-being for all our, our community and Kenyans at large. Um, with those few words, I pray believing and trusting in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, thank Amen. you Amen. very much everyone for attending. Thank you.